But there's something about Van Gogh's legacy which is much more important than his fathering this or that ism of modern art. Vincent's passionate belief was that people wouldn't just see his pictures, but feel the rush of life in them. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most credible voice in true crime. So, a year ago, virtually a year ago today, it was actually the 17th of May last year, I went from Auvers-sur-Oise into Paris and I went to look for the, um, the residence of Theo van Gogh and um, that was basically where Vincent van Gogh spent around about three days before he went to Auvers-sur-Oise. So uh, basically Vincent went from the asylum in Saint-Rémy to Paris, stayed with his brother for about two, three days, and then went to Auvers-sur-Oise, right? So in this period that we're in now, um, 18th of May, 19th of May, he's still in Paris. And so you would eventually arrive in uh, Auvers-sur-Oise, somewhere where he would eventually die, uh, two, two months later, two months and 10 days later, um, well, he would leave for that trip on the 20th, uh, 19th, 20th of May. So in this episode, we're going to go through the last couple of letters Vincent van Gogh wrote from the asylum. And again, we just want to get the sense of his mindset when, when he's leaving this asylum. He's basically coming out of lockdown and, and he's got to make arrangements, right? And so... There was a letter to Theo on the 1st, which we did yesterday. And today we're going to deal with the letter sent to Theo on Friday, the 2nd of May. We're also going to look at Theo's response to that, which came the very next day, the 3rd of May. Then another letter to Theo on Sunday, the 4th of May. And then basically a week went by and uh, Theo then wrote to Vincent again on the 10th of May and then um, and then Theo uh, Vincent wrote to Theo on the 11th and then also to the postman Joseph Gino um, on about the 12th of May and then there was the final letter to Theo on the um, Tuesday the 13th of May Okay, so let's start off by going to the letter of the sec of the second um, of May, and Vincent writes, "My dear Theo, once again I'm writing to you to say that I'm staying well, yet I feel a little worn out by this long crisis, and I dare believe that the planned move will refresh my ideas more." So th there he's saying, you know, I'm I'm staying well. I'm I'm you know. And I'm starting to believe that, that this is going to be good for me. At the same time, he's saying, I feel a little worn out. I feel quite worn out by this period of lockdown, this, this long crisis that I've been through. He goes on to say, I think that it'll be best for me to go myself to see this doctor in the country as soon as possible. Then we can soon decide if I'm going to lodge with him or temporarily at the inn, and thus we'll avoid an overlong stay in Paris, a thing that I would fear. So what he says in the second paragraph, he's kind of saying, um, thanks for your idea about the doctor in the country. Uh, maybe I should stay with him or maybe I should stay, you know, somewhere else. Um, and he's kind of saying, you know, I'd like to avoid staying for too long in Paris. Now, bear in mind, if Van Gogh stays in Paris, it kind of means he's going to be staying with his brother, which I think his brother is a little bit uh, concerned about. As much as Theo loves Vincent, he's sort of in. He's sort of continuing with his life. He's, he's got a wife. He's got a child. And although he wants to look after his brother, he's um, also wants to kind of keep him at a safe distance. If that makes sense. Then Van Gogh goes on. He says, "You remember that six months ago I told you after a crisis that if it happened again, I would ask you to let me move." We're at that point, although I don't feel capable of passing judgment 
on the way they have of dealing with the patients here. It's enough that I feel that what remains to me of reason and capacity for work is absolutely in danger. So he's kind of saying um, the difficulty he has where he is is that he's, he's struggling to work. He's kind of saying where he is, you know, in terms of other patients and the, the situation that he's in, it's difficult for him to work. It's almost like saying, you know, I can't work while I'm in lockdown. I need to, I need to be, come out of lockdown so I can continue working as normal. He goes on to say, well, on the contrary, I'm confident that I can prove to this doctor you speak of that I still know how to work logically and he'll treat me accordingly. And since he's, he likes painting, there's a sufficient chance that a solid friendship will result from it. So look at that assessment of his own uh, mental um, uh, situation. He, he kind of diagnoses himself as, uh, he says, um, I, I still know how to work logically, right? He goes on to say, I don't think Mr. Peyron will oppose a very prompt departure. Besides, I tell myself that the pleasure of spending a few days with you will do me a lot of good. And from that moment on, we can really count on a period of relative health. So don't delay in taking the necessary steps so that this doesn't drag on. So this letter is kind of to say, you know, they've already kind of decided that he's leaving and it's, tr it's, it's trying to make sure that, that there's no second thoughts about it. It's trying to make sure that there's no um, doubt, that there's no uh, hesitation. And again, think about the, the kind of presence of mind it takes. He, he hasn't just sort of sent a letter saying, OK, let's leave. And he's kind of he's, he's got such mental acuity. He's got such mental alertness that he's trying to make absolutely damn sure that that his lockdown does end. And that's that's what this letter is all about, to, to say, OK, everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about anything, um, you know. We're gonna make the. We're gonna do the most appropriate thing under the circumstances. And he's also kind of backing himself, saying, "You know, what? I think I'm gonna be okay. I think I'm gonna have a period of relatively good health. Um, so, so, so don't delay. Let's get this going. Let, let's get this uh, show on the road." He goes on to say, "Once I'm there, I can send for my bed, which is in all." And besides, I would move anyway, preferring to be in an asylum where the patients worked to this awful idleness here, which really seems to me quite simply a crime. So he's just referring to where he is. People just sort of sit around and do nothing and it's getting to him. You know, he, he's not the kind of guy that, that sits around. He, he wants to paint. He wants to be inspired. He wants to walk into the countryside. He wants to, I guess, socialize as well. And uh, so he says, um, anyway, you'll tell me that this is seen more or less everywhere and that there's even plenty of it in Paris. Whatever the case, I hope that we'll see each other again very soon. The etchings you sent me are really beautiful. Opposite this, I've scribbled a croquet after a painting I've done of three figures which are in the background of the Lazarus etching. I'm not going to go through his description of it, but he talks about different colors and the handkerchief and the resurrected man's face and so on. And uh, he goes on to say, if I were still to have at my disposal the model who posed for the Berkus, uh and the other whose portrait you've just received after Gauguin's drawing, then certainly I'd try to execute it in a large size, this canvas. The personalities being what I would have dreamed of as characters. But leaving aside subjects of this kind, there will still remain the study from life of peasants and landscape. So what he's kind of alluding to here is he's sort of talking about he wishes he had a model. He wishes he had a real person that he could sort of sketch. And that is one of the first things that happened when he went to Orvesua is he was in a situation where he was starting to paint real people again. And, and that's something that didn't really happen that much when he was at the asylum.
he goes on to say as regards the order for colors should I remain here for another few days please send off part of it at once and he emphasizes that so it's kind of saying look um, I'm coming to you but if if I'm going to be here a few more days please send me the the um, the order immediately uh, he says if however I leave in the next few days which I hope then he says you can keep it in Paris so he's kind of not setting an ultimatum but he's saying to his brother you know if I'm going to be here um, for for a while um, send the latest order immediately but you know and in other words he's kind of saying here he acknowledges that his fate's in his brother's hands and so only his brother's going to know whether he should send the paint or not because it's no there's no point in sending it to him and then Van Gogh returns immediately and he's now going to take the paint with him so let's see what his brother says in response right um, Van Gogh signs off saying in any event write to me in the next few days I hope that you'll have received the canvas is in good order. I've done another one of a nook of greenery, which seems to have some freshness. I've also attempted a copy of Delacroix's Good Samaritan. I think from a note in Le Figaro that Pierre Cost must have a darn good painting in the salon. Warm regards to your wife. I'm very much looking forward to making her acquaintance at last. And good handshake in thought, ever yours, Vincent. So bear in mind, he hasn't even met um, Thea's wife yet. So now we're going to go on to the next, um, the next letter, Thea's response, and let's let's have a look at what how he responds to that. And it, it's a letter that arrives the very next day. My dear Vincent, I can't tell you how pleased I was by your letter, or rather your two letters. I was saying to Joe the day before my birthday that if a letter came from Vincent, I would no longer know what I could wish for to complete my happiness. And there you are, your letter arrived. Of course, I'd like to feel better still, and above all, that your sadness might be dispelled. And that is how he... Um, how he, um, I won't say diagnoses, but how he encapsulates Van Gogh's condition. He doesn't describe it as madness or illness even, just as sadness, right? He says, your consignment of canvases has arrived too, and there are some that are very, very beautiful. The orderly and the other fellow with his swollen face are extraordinary. The branch of the almond trees in blossom shows that you haven't exhausted these subjects. You may have missed the season of the blossoming trees this year, but let's hope that that won't be the case next time. The Malay copies are perhaps the finest things you've done and make me believe that big surprises still await us the day you set yourself to doing figure compositions. The consignment of Tasse and Tangi colors has left. I hadn't, done, I hadn't yet received your second letter and I told myself that you could well use the extra half. So... This is the answer to Van Gogh's thing question, which is, you know, um, if I'm going to be here a few more days, um, send me the the paint immediately. If not, don't send it. And what he's saying here is, well, I've sent it already. And the, the the fact is that Van Gogh would basically leave after receiving the consignment, and um, so that was how that sort of played out. Um, he went on to say the Aurea canvas is one of the finest you've done yet it has the richness of a peacock's tail and that was a gift for the uh, art critic Albert Aurea and he says it has the richness okay so yeah, that's we've gone through that he says I'll take it to him directly uh, I'd I'd had the frame made that you described for I certainly owe him that and he isn't rich. This is a reference to Aurier. He goes on to say, and now the most important thing in your second letter, that is your plans to come here. He says, I'm very happy that you feel the strength to undertake a change and I absolutely agree that you should come as soon as possible. But you say that I myself must fix the time when you're to come. So you kind of have an interesting thing where Vincent is sort of politely 
leaving it to his brother to decide when he should come and um, Theo is sort of like well you know do you want me to decide right and uh, he says you say that I myself must fix the time I daren't take a decision and only you with Dr. Perrin's advice can take this responsibility upon yourself so Theo kind of puts the ball back in his court and he says um, you need to decide and you know uh, incorporate Dr. Perron's advice, not Mr. Perron, Dr. Uh, Van Gogh refers, him to his, refers to him as Mr. And he's saying, you know, have your doctor decide when would be the most suitable time. And that kind of makes sense because Theo's in Paris. How does he know when should work, right? Anyway, uh, Theo goes on to say, your journey to all was absolutely disastrous for you. Uh, will the traveling not do you harm this time? So just being cautious, just being careful. He says, if I were you, I'd act entirely in accordance with Mr. Peyron's view. And in any event, on the day you've decided to come here, you absolutely must be accompanied during the entire journey. And that's emphasized by someone you trust. So, so Theo is saying, we need someone to chaperone you the whole way to Paris, right? He says, the fatigue of the journey and the sensation of rediscovering places you have known may have an influence on your illness. If possible, I'd so much like to have you with us at least for a while. And if you do everything um, to take care of yourself, it's very likely that all will go well. And what does he mean by that? I mean, doesn't he mean, you know, don't drink on your on your trip? Don't... Um, you know, just stay calm and, and try and get from A to B like a normal person. Just behave and, and, and stay calm, right? He goes on to say, you say that the people down there understand nothing of painting, but yeah, it's absolutely the same. And you mustn't think that you'll find it otherwise anywhere except as an exception. So his brother is saying, you know, basically everywhere, uh, no one's going to really understand what you're doing. He goes on to say, we have frequented one category of people and have made it their principal occupation. But apart from them, it's Hebrew to the people. It's a kind of way that today we say it's Greek, you know, it's Greek to me or something. He goes on to say, I hope that you'll be able to write to me, that you're getting better and better, and that your plans can soon be realized. However, don't have too many illusions about life in the north, after all, Every part of the world has its pros and cons. So his brother's being very measured. He's saying, you know, I really want you to come. Your work is excellent, but let's, um, let's be rational about this. Right? And he's reasoning with his brother. You know, he's, re he's reasoning with his brother under the assumption that his brother's reasonable. He goes on to say, I'll write to you soon and shall look for lithographs of the masters. I'll send them at the same time as the Brabant drawings. Be of good heart and good handshake. Thanks again for your letters and for your consignment. If you need anything, say so. Business is going well and I have everything I need. Warm regards from Joe and the little one. Enclosed is their portrait. Yours, Theo. So this is uh, Vincent's response, his reply to his brother sent the very next day, Sunday the 4th of May, 1890. And he writes, My dear brother, thanks for your kind letter and for the portrait of Joe, which is very pretty and is very successful as a pose. Well, I'll be very simple and as practical as possible in my reply. First, I categorically reject what you say that I should be accompanied throughout the journey. Now, this gives you a, an idea of the kind of personality Vincent is. He's kind of a stubborn guy. He's kind of, um, how can I put it? He's kind of polite and uh, considerate and um, I don't know, I don't want to say balanced, but he's sort of kind of got a reasonable thing about him, but then he can also be very um, single-minded. You know, he's, he's not someone that you're gonna easily walk all over. So when his brother says, I insist that someone takes you the whole way, he says, no, that's not going to happen. And he's quite stern. I mean, I categorically reject what you say. And he says it in the first four lines. You know, he's certainly not, um, he's certainly not so weak 
in his head or in his heart to not stand up to his brother, right? He says, uh, once on the train, I no longer run any risk. I'm not one of those who are dangerous, even supposing I have a crisis. So it's kind of a fair point. He says, you know, once I'm on the train, I don't need to be accompanied. I mean, I basically just sit in my chair and then I go from A to B. That, that's all that needs to happen, which is a fair point. But um, it also kind of shows that Van Gogh doesn't really take his own situation very seriously or he doesn't take his own condition um, very seriously. Um, he goes on to say, um, supposing I have a crisis, aren't there other passengers in the carriage? And besides, don't they know what to do in all the stations in such a case? He says, you're giving yourself worries here that weigh on me so heavily that it might directly discourage me. He's saying, don't worry. Um, you worrying is, is discouraging me, so stop worrying. He goes on to say, I've just said the same thing to Mr. Perron, and I pointed out to him that crises like the one I've just had have always been followed by three or four months of complete calm. So how's that for a diagnosis? He says, you know, I have a crisis and then I'm fine for like three or four months. And now I'm in that four month period, right? He goes on, and I think that's also worth bearing in mind, is he basically is saying, um, you know, after a crisis, expect me to be healthy for three or four months. And does that mean he, he did have a crisis at the end end of the period when he when he committed suicide that's not a bad argument but uh it's it's also cutting it a bit fine i mean he died two months and um two and a half months basically i guess after his previous crisis you could maybe make an argument for three anyway he goes on to say um I wish to take advantage of this period to move. I want to move in any event. My desire to leave here is now absolute. So he's kind of not um, mincing words. He's saying, I've made up my mind. You know, that's not going to change. I'm leaving no matter what. He goes on to say, I don't feel competent to judge the way they treat patients here. I don't feel any desire to enter into the details. But please remember that I warned you around six months ago that if I was seized by a crisis of the same nature I'd wish to change asylums. And I've delayed too long already, having allowed an attack to go by in the meantime. I was then right in the middle of work and I wanted to finish canvases in progress, otherwise I would no longer be here right now. So saying it's because of work that he, he never left previously. He says, right, so I'm going to tell you that it seems to me that a fortnight at the most, a week though, would please me more should be enough to take the necessary steps to move so he's telling his brother okay this is when it's going to happen he says i shall have someone accompany me as far as tarason even one or two stations further if you insist so he's saying i will have someone come along with me tarason is a station or a town not far from all i mean you you see that place on um, uh, road signs uh, between saint Rami and all so it's, it's in that low locale right but not obviously much further and then he says um, once I've arrived in Paris I'll send a telegram when I leave here and then you can come and pick me up at Gare de Lyon right that's the station in Paris he goes on to say, now it would seem preferable to me to go and see this doctor in the country as soon as possible and we'd leave the luggage at the station. So he's kind of saying, well, you know, I'll go just straight from the station to this, this Dr. Gachet. And he says, can you see how, what a central figure Dr. Gachet is even before he's left the asylum of saint Rami, even before he's arrived in Paris? Dr. Gachet has already emerged as this central figure that he's gonna is going to um go to in over she was do you see that he goes on to say so i would only stay at your place for let's say two or three days then i'd leave for this village where, where i would start off by lodging at the inn so um this is this is exactly how it played out right now is the time that he would be spending with uh Theo at his place in Paris so for two or three days and then he left for the village 
Uh, so that all went according to plan. He goes on to say, this, it seems to me, is what you could do in the next few days without delay. So in a quite a nice way, Vincent is saying, um, I think I think this is what you need to do for me. Uh, do, do the following. Number one, he says, write to our future friend, that doctor. This is Dr. Gachet. And he tells him what to write. He says, he writes, my brother would very much like to make your acquaintance and as he would prefer to consult you before prolonging his stay in Paris, uh, hopes that you will approve of his spending a few weeks in your village where he will come to make some studies. He has complete confidence that he will reach an understanding with you, believing that with a return to the north his illness will abate, whereas by staying on in the south his condition would be in danger of becoming more acute. And that's the end of that message that he wants his brother to pass on. Now, what's quite fascinating here is he, he basically is allowing his brother to sort of eavesdrop on what he means to say to Dr. Gachet, uh, which is another way of him also saying, I'm definitely leaving here and, and this is how I see my own illness, blah, 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 blah. So it's it's a little bit of mind fuckery from Van Van Gogh to his brother, l- letting him in on what what he means to be his message to to the doctor, but it's also I guess his message to Doctor Gachet. He goes on to say, "There, you could write to him like that. We'd send him a telegram the day after my arrival in Paris, or the day after that, and he'd probably wait for me at the station." The surroundings here are starting to weigh on me more than I could express. My word, I've waited patiently for over a year. I need air. I feel damaged by boredom and grief. So he's really laying it on quite thick. He's just saying, I'm done. Uh, I'm I'm getting out of here. And, you know, it's, it's happening. And look at the way that he describes what is happening. How he describes his state of mind. He, he says... You know, I've been here, I've been stuck here for a year, he says, and it, it, um, I've been patient, and he says, I need air. You know, I feel damaged by boredom and grief, not by an illness, not by madness, but by normal things, by boredom, by grief, by, by you know, um, regret. N- nothing, there's nothing here about me- mental illness. He goes on to say, then work is pressing. I'd be wasting my time here. Why then, I ask you, do you fear accidents so much? It isn't that that ought to frighten you. My word, since I've been here, I've seen people fall over or lose their mind every day. What's more serious is to try and take misfortune into account. I assure you that it's already something to resign oneself to living under God, even the event of it being sympathetic and to sacrifice one's freedom to stand outside society and to have only one's work without distraction. That has carved out wrinkles that won't be rubbed out in a hurry. So he's kind of just saying, you know, it's been tough being here. And, you know, I'm not just in a hospital. There are people who sort of um, have me in my room kind of under guard. You know, my, my freedom is kind of... Um, the say so of of other people and that's caused him to develop wrinkles right he goes on to say um now that's now that it's beginning to weigh too heavily upon me here i think that is only right to put a stop to it so again he's really laying it on thick he's saying i've had enough he's saying i've been here over a year that's enough now he goes on to say not only write to dr gachet but also please write to mr Peyron that he should let me leave. So he's saying, can you write a letter to my doctor here recommending that I can leave, right? And he says, let's say on the 15th at the latest. So basically four days from this date. And it ended up being, I think, the day after that. So so it's not, not too bad, n- not um, too much of a delay. He says, if I waited, I would let the good moment of calm between two crises pass. And leaving now, I'll have the free time necessary to make the other doctor's acquaintance. Then, if in a while from now the illness were to recur, it would be foreseen. And according to how serious it was, 
we could see if I can continue at liberty or if I must stick myself in an asylum for good. In the latter case, as I told you in my last letter, I would go into an institution where the patients work in the fields and in the workshop. I think that even more than here, I'd find, I then find subjects for painting. Well, this is quite a long letter. He goes on to say, Consider then that the journey costs a lot, that it's pointless, and that I do have the right to change asylums if I please. So he's kind of quite desperate here. He's saying, I know this is expensive, um, but I, ha I have the right to change asylums. I want to be in a better, uh, um, I want better care, right? And he says, it isn't my absolute freedom that I'm demanding. He's not saying, you know, I want to be let out of here to do whatever I want. He's saying, um, you know, I will be prepared to go into another asylum or whatever, but please, I just need to get out of here. He says, I've tried to be patient up to this point. I haven't done any harm to anyone. Is it fair to have me accompanied like a dangerous animal? So instead of, you know, right in the beginning, he said, I categorically reject what you said. He's coming to it again and, and, and saying, please, man, you know, please, can I have my way on this? Can You know, because he's, he's thinking he's not going to be able to find someone to accompany him all the way to Paris. And if his brother's going to make it conditional on that, he's going to be in trouble. So he says, um, I've, I've tried to be patient. Um, I'm not a dangerous animal. You know, I haven't done harm to anyone. He says, um, no, thank you. I protest. If a crisis occurs, they know what to do in every station. And then I'd let them do it. And he goes on to say, but I dare believe that my composure won't desert me. I have so much distress at leaving like this that the distress will be stronger than the madness. I'll therefore have the necessary nerve, I dare believe. And there's a reference to madness. And he's saying, I can control my madness. He's saying, um, I, um, he, he says, Mr. Peyron says vague things to free himself from responsibility, but that way we'd never, never get to the end of it. The thing would drag on and on and in the end, we'd be angry with each other. As for me, my patience is at an end. At an end, my dear brother, I can't go on. I must move even if as a stopgap. However, there really is a chance that the change will do me good. Work is going well. I've done two canvases in the fresh grass, of the fresh grass in the park, one of which is extremely simple. He has a hasty croquet of it. He goes on to describe what he's painted, the trunk and the colors and so on. Uh, he says, I'll be out of doors there. I'm sure that the desire to work will devour me and make me insensible to everything else and in a good mood. And that much I fully agree with. I think he uh, was out of doors a lot. Uh, we know that he was from the people at the Ravu Inn. We know that work did devour him. We know how much he painted and we know that he was kind of in a good mood, but we, we will review those letters from Ove Suwa soon enough. He says, and I'll let myself go there, not without consideration, but without dwelling on regret. So he's kind of talking about, do you see how he's talking about starting a new chapter, turning a new leaf and, um, you know, living anew? living living life afresh, uh, starting fresh kind of thing. And that is exactly what he did and what he was trying to do and, and that you can actually see in his art. He goes on to say, they say that in painting one must seek nothing and hope for nothing but a good painting and a good talk and a good dinner as the height of happiness, not counting the less brilliant interludes. Perhaps it's true and why refuse to take what is possible? especially if by doing so one gives the illness the slip. So his um, ambitions are fairly modest. He basically just wants to go somewhere else and just try to paint um, well or, or just trying to be a good artist and have some good dinners and he calls that the height of happiness. 
He goes on to say, um, why, is it, why refuse to take what is possible, especially by doing so one gives... So he's just saying, you know, the, think of the possibilities of, of, of this move. He goes on to say, good handshake to you and to Joe, and I think I'm going to do a painting for myself after the subject of the portrait. It may not be a resemblance, perhaps, but anyway, I'll try. More soon, I hope, and come on, spare me this forced traveling companion. That's the third time that he's mentioned it, right? Um, ever yours, Vincent. Okay, so we 35 minutes into this episode. Uh, we've gone through three letters. I'm going to do the next three letters in uh, an episode after this. So uh, you can look out for that. Um, yeah, I'm not going to take it further than that. Uh, I am going to start putting up um, photos from my trip to Ove Suwa once we go into Vincent van Gogh. Um, getting there right which is is going to be in about a day or two's time now bear in mind uh in in my trip a year ago um i was just about uh, i spent about four days in orve and 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 at this point i was already on about i think three or four days i think the 19th was about the day that i actually left uh france for amsterdam Around about the 19th. The 17th was the day that I went into Paris from Ove Suwa. And then I, when I returned from Paris, I actually ate at the Revue Inn, which is the same place that Vincent van Gogh had his dinners and where he spent his last two months of his life. So, um, so I'll, I'll uh, talk to you guys about that. I'll show you pictures of that and uh, perhaps even some excerpts out of my diary um, for the rest um, I am going to be uh, covering um, some Madeleine McCann content uh, on this channel so look out for that and my book Deeper Into Darkness um, it's the follow-up to Deep Into Darkness. Uh, that's already available on Amazon. You can Google it, um, Madeleine McCann, Deep Into, into Darkness, or uh, do a search on Kindle, um, Amazon Kindle. So um, if you don't come right, just uh, leave a comment, and I'll give you the actual link. But it shouldn't be very hard to find otherwise. Um, Otherwise, uh, I'm also very interactive and available on Patreon, uh, covering, still covering the Chris Watts case, but also covering uh, recent true crime, including the disappearance of Suzanne Morphew, as well as uh, various other series. So until, uh, until the next time, um, stay safe. Uh, keep up that social distancing, wash those hands, and I'll see you guys next time.